Hello, and welcome to the True Crime Lounge Podcast. I do have a YouTube channel that you can go check out as well. Um, I also, For my social media, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, I do have a Patreon. You can go and help support if you would like. Um, I also have a merch shop that you can go and check out as well. It may be buy something. Um, today, now, now I got all that out of the way. Let's dive into our mini series here on the True Crime Lounge. So, today we are going to be talking about the case of Maury Travis. And, it coincides with spooky season. I love Halloween, if you can't tell. Like, you can't see my dress if I just put my, it has skeletons and stuff on it. It's, and then I just put my skeleton ball back in my car. He's the best passenger because he, he doesn't complain, he doesn't judge you. Very awesome, right? Now, I do have a speech impediment that I've had since I was a kid, so I'm getting that out of the way as well. Now, let's get started, shall we? Maury Travis is a serial killer and rapist whose victimology focused on prostitutes, whose his number of victims range from 12 to 17, with his days occurring in 2001 to 2002. His methodology was ligature strangulation, and he was caught when he anonymously mailed to the body of his one of his victims to the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Yeah. Now, one thing I will say about this case is this shows how technology really did help solve this case right here. Um, so the FBI and police tracked down Travis. They didn't need to use bloodhounds for any of the other like investigation tools that they normally would. Instead, this is where technology came into play. They used um, a wealth of information through Microsoft, Expedia, and other internet companies on who visited their websites last in service. The breakthrough in which appeared to be a difficult case underscore why such information is valuable resource for police. And sometimes a concern for civil li- libertarians. So, his arrest was set in motion. And a couple of weeks earlier, when a dis- post dispatch reporter received an anonymous letter praising the story of a profiling a slain prostitute, along with the letter, after finding a skeleton there, authorities focused on the map. They appeared to have come. To Come, this this map here appeared to come from the internet service. Some an internet service. Detectives were would be able to find an apparent match on Expedia.com. So, on May 30th, Expedia told told him that Jim that Jim Jiminez told Jiminez told him that Jiminez that Microsoft. Which was based on in Redmond, Washington, provided information for his map site. The FBI was issued a subpoena requesting records for any maps of the West Alton May between May 18th and May 21st. It would take four days to get an answer, but June 3rd, Microsoft would report back, and that one computer had done it. The co- company said that on May 20th, um, the, com- the computer has zoomed in-, in on the map of West Alton, Missouri. Also, approximately 10 miles of crime in a chronological order in with an exact match of a map sent to Post Dispatch. Hmm. MSN or Microsoft, I'll, go- I'll use that interchangeably so. MSN could track, the pro- tra- could not track, could not provide a name. They were able to provide an address, which was meaningless to most people. But this was internet protocol. What could you do, right? So, the FBI would translate the IP address by using WorldCom Inc. The company. This provided local telephone numbers and contact, connect, internet services and their dial up customers. Customers, we're all come assigned a temporary IP address to for each internet session. The question 
the question who was using the IP address. Well, on June 4th, Worldcom's Internet Division, UNET, identified the user the evening of May 20th as MSN, who was MSN Mari Tra uh, dash well slash Mari Travis. The FBI w went back to MSN to say to, to identify th that same say that if identified a customer that customer was Mari Travis and Mari Toy Travis of Ferguson. This was the groundwork for surveillance. So on June seventh, the FBI would arrest and search warrant authorities that said helped solidify the case with DNA and tower treads evidence linking a 36-year-old water waiter to some of the killings. Just some, not all. So Travis was eventually charged with two counts of kidnapping in federal court. Documents show that he was linked to seven murders overall. Police think he may have killed ten or more. On, on June 17th, without even a minute guilt, he hung himself in jail. So, this appeared, so, so, it had appeared that Travis was unaware of the case with what internet use can be traced. In fact, this is this lack of awareness that coupled with the easy use of technology by law enforcement. Um, David Sobel who uh, he he is a who was a general counsel for the Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, would say that many users are not aware of the tracks that can be left behind when they surf the web and ver visit various sites. He would also say that most users have an illusion of anonymity when they use the internet, which is the case that demonstrates not well founded because. There is quite a bit of traceability in the internet. So, in 1986, elect the Electronics Communication Privacy Act of 1986 required federal law enforcement to take various steps to retain information through internet companies. The law will require prosecutors to issue a subpoena and obtain a court order in which to warrant from a judge for certain types of information. These also allow prosecutors to accept information given voluntarily by the internet company. The Department of Justice described the law as unusually complicated in a manual for prosecutors that was published. The manual states that navigating through ECPA requires agents and prosecutors to apply various classifications and dev devised by ECPA drafters and in facts of each case before they can figure out the proper procedure of, of attaining information. The law left unclear whether a simple subpoena could attain an IP address or if a prosecutor needs an order to be signed by a judge. Khan would also say that the lack of clarity meant prosecutors did not believe, need a judge's order, but Justice Department spokesman Mark Corellio said the agency believed that a subpoena was necessary. So, I have it here on my screen. Lovely. Anyway, this debate was solved after September after 9/11 attacks when President George W. Bush signed the USA Patriot Act, giving the Justice Department new powers to fight terrorism. It provides prosecutors clear authority to obtain temporary assigned IP addresses and other information from the internet companies through the use of a subpoena. In the Travis case. The FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Illinois had not have not revealed how to obtain the information, but from MSN and WorldCom, whether by subpoena, which warrant, or neither. But MSN and their state said said that the federal prosecutors had issued a subpoena. Um, Sabell would have given the strong link between the map. Sent to the post dispatch and declines. There is little doubt that the prosecutors were right to pursue the information and could easily obtain a warrant. However, well, even so, this permitted prosecutors to obtain such 
information through the use of a subpoena in unilateral step that does not require oversight of a judge. It is not sufficient protection for the public. So, what about the matching of the IP address? Well, most of you know what an IP address is, so even now I have an IP address. Everyone has an IP address, right? Well, this is basically how it works. So, basically the first set of numbers you get identifies the network to which the computer belongs to. The rest of the numbers identifies the actual computer on that network, basically. Computer science it was going to be my, one of my majors, but I was like, nah, I like the legal field more than I do anything, so I do like doing, I do like doing some computer work on the side, not much, though. Anyway, the map downloaded from the internet led the FBI suspected the serial killer. Mari Troy Travis. The download was May 20th. As someone, May 20th, the investigation began May 24th. The FBI got involved May 30th. The, the IP address, June 3rd. The username, June 4th. And the information was also June 4th. And the arrest was June 7th. So, what about this? If John Robinson is the first serial killer to lure victims via the internet, then Maury Travis was has a distinction to be called the first serial killer apprehended because of the internet. Things were going well for Travis. It was a, he was successfully slaying um, drug addicts and prostitutes in St. Louis, the neighboring East St. Louis, Illinois. Police were reluctant to admit that the serial killer was responsible for the rash of killing, his activities had caused barely a ripple, and even though the cities he prowled, perhaps because of the apparent lack of attention, he decided it was a good idea to point the authorities to decomposing bodies of the undiscovered victims near West Alton, Missouri, by sending directions to a local newspaper, a woman's body. Um, who is still unidentified, was found sure, found enough across the road from where tr two of Travis's victims were discovered. Unfortunately for Travis, he had enclosed an internet generated map in his typed letter. Yeah. Police soon tracked the map, using it to the only IP address downloaded it recently. The user of MSS Maury Travis. On oh, June 7, 2002, they arrested him and began an extensive search um, of his Ferguson, Missouri home. Their suspect told investigators he knew what they had come to get. They had come to get him, but would make no direct confessions under his initial interrogation, and he would manage to hang himself in jail three days later, despite being under a suicide watch. So, investigators are now left to forge ahead knowing that they will get no help from the man who knew precisely what happened and numerous women he killed, dumped like trash to avoid the deal and the prospect of collecting evidence against a man that was already avoided justice. See? But the police could actually, there was like, with this search though, the police did actually gain a lot of evidence against him. And he was described as a neighbor, quiet, but smart and friendly. And, but there was blood splatters all over his apartment, home though, that's the thing. So, what about a case update? Well. They have found some gruesome videotapes of bondage and torture found here. And everything's like... He thought it was more about using technology. That's the thing, like... 
thing is, technology actually worked against him in this case. Alright, y'all, that's it for today's episode. I will see y'all next time. Y'all have a spooky holiday.